Thank you. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary. Next item of business is a statement by Fergus Ewing, Cabinet Secretary on the Common Agricultural Policy. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement, and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. I call on Fergus Ewing. Ten minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding officer, for the whole of this Parliament's lifetime, farm policy and support in Scotland has been determined by the Common Agricultural Policy and part funded by the EU. There is no doubt that the year ahead will be difficult, which is why this government has made clear, no matter what else happens, that farm and rural businesses will receive their current payment entitlements. Not just in 2019, but in every year, largely as they currently are until 2022. This uh, commitment is at the heart of our uh, uh, transition plan entitled Stability and Simplicity, which sets out the most detailed proposals of any administration in the UK to provide certainty and stability on farm and rural support. I will return to this transition plan shortly. But I want to update Parliament on the progress we have made in relation to this year's payments and in making improvements to our business and IT processes. One of our key objectives this year was to help more farmers and crofters get online. We undertook a campaign around the SAF application window, offering support to help more customers switch from paper-based to online applications. Our approach has worked with the ratio of online to paper SAF applications increasing from 78% last year to 88.6%. In the coming year, we'll continue to seek ways of further enhancing our business approach and payment system with a core purpose in mind, to improve our ability to make payments efficiently. Presenting officer, we've achieved the target of 95% of 2017 Pillar 1 payments by the deadline of 30th of June. And we have now completed 99% of basic payments, greening young farmer payments, and 97% of both the Scottish Suckler Beef and Upland Sheep, Sheep Support Scheme payments. We have started making payments on all 2017 Pillar 2 schemes and are ahead of where we were at this point last year. Notably, we reached our 95% land manager's options payment target two months ahead of schedule. To ensure our most marginalized farmers and crofters receive their alpha support on time, in April, we provided over 8,000 farmers and crofters with 90% of their entitlements through the 2017 ELFAS loan scheme, worth over £53 million to them and the rural economy. Since then, we have completed processing over 89% of full ELFAS 2017 payments. Furthermore, we're working hard to deliver all Pillar 2 payments by the end of December and before then, if possible. We will, of course, continue to update the REC Committee of our progress monthly. One thing we hadn't planned for this year, presiding officer, was the adverse weather, which has impacted considerably on farming in Scotland. But we have acted swiftly and, I hope, effectively to provide extra support. This includes the National Basic Payment Support Loan Scheme to provide financial support early this winter for our farmers and crofters. Loan offer letters have now issued to over 14,500 businesses and we expect to begin making payments from early October. Eligible farmers and crofters will be offered up to 90% of what they are due as part of the 2018 Basic Payment Scheme. A similar scheme in 2017 delivered payments of more than £317 million to over 13,500 farmers uh, and crofters and into Scotland's rural economy. And I expect this scheme to have similar effect. We know there will be pressures on winter forage. So we have also sought and received approval from the European Commission to allow farmers and crofters flexibility in the implementation of the 2017 greening rules regarding ecological focus areas. And we made arrangements to extend the planned beef efficiency scheme workshops on livestock nutrition this autumn to all farmers and crofters. Presenting officer, with the potential disruption of Brexit looming, I want to give our farmers, crofters and land managers as much funding certainty as is possible. I'm also determined that we continue to pursue our aims for this rural development program. So, I can announce today that we will launch a further round of the Agri-Environment Climate Scheme early next year. Since 2015, this scheme has provided over £140 million of support for land managers 
to deliver environmental actions. We expect this round to allocate in the region of £40 million to successful applications in line with previous years. Anyone considering activity to protect and enhance their land assets and our environment through, for example, improving water quality, managing flood risk, and mitigating and adapting to climate change should start preparing their funding application now. Presenting officer, this certainty is in stark contrast with the lack of clarity on key funding questions from the UK government. One of the most pressing is on what basis Scotland's future funding allocation will be made. That cannot be on the basis of the current low rate per hectare, the lowest in the UK. Since 2013, the Scottish Government, with the support of this Parliament, has been trying to get this resolved. The failure of successive Tory Westminster governments to honour its promises on convergence funding is problematic in two key ways. First, Scottish farmers have been shortchanged to the tune of £160 million. That amounts to around £14,000 for each hill farmer or crofter in this land. Secondly, it means our farmers and crofters could continue to lose out in the future if these historic payment rates are used to determine funding allocations beyond Brexit. I welcomed the most recent promise from Michael Gove to review this situation, but I have been less welcoming of the unwarranted delay in getting that review underway. Let me be clear, I will not stop pressing until it, it is, uh, and Scotland is guaranteed a fair funding allocation in the future. And we must also focus our resources on planning for the future. In June, I launched a public consultation proposing a five-year transition period for farming and rural support under the theme of stability and simplicity. The consultation presiding officer closed on the 15th of August with over 120 responses, and I thank all who responded. Those responses are currently being analysed carefully and a report will be published later this autumn. But I can advise Parliament that we will get on with establishing a task force to produce measures which will simplify the farm and rural support payment system from 2022 onwards. The task force, uh, the task force will be led internally and involve external stakeholders and contrib contributors. Crucially, we want to ensure that the future of farming is represented through the inclusion of young farmers on the task force. Presiding officer, I'm acutely aware that we must also start to shape a longer term approach to future rural support. We've already had many thoughtful propositions and innovative ideas to work from, from stakeholders organizations, from this government's agriculture champions, from Professor Russell Griggs' greening group, and very shortly, from the National Council of Rural Advisors, whose final report is expected imminently. It is important that this parliament is given an opportunity to contribute its views. I therefore undertake to discuss how best to achieve this with all parliamentary groups and to bring forward a motion which allows us to debate, to debate and hopefully agree the principles to underpin Scotland's future farm policy. Presiding officer, we, all of us, face an uncertain future. The prospects, especially if there is a no-deal Brexit, are not great. That is why, in our programme for government, we committed to providing as much certainty and stability in the short term, uh, in the term of five years, as we can. This year, we have focused on improving our approach to CAP, not least to make payments more efficiently. We have made significant progress and we will continue to seek to do more in the coming year. By the end of this year, not only will the vast majority of farmers, crofters and land managers have received their 2017 cap payments, but most will also have received 90% of their 2018 basic payments too. In all, we have paid over 500 million pounds into Scotland's rural businesses and economy, demonstrating clearly this government's determination to deliver for rural Scotland. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in the statement. I hope to allow about 20 minutes for questions. 
after which we must move on to the next item of business. Those members who wish to ask a question, please press your request to speak buttons now. And I call firstly um, Donald Cameron, please, Mr Cameron. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of his statement, and I refer to crofting and farming in my register of interests. I had looked forward to this statement because I thought that at last we might begin to see some detail of a system of support for Scottish agriculture. So it is with a sense of deep frustration that I listen to the Cabinet Secretary again failing to outline specific policies in this regard. Instead, on the back of the several reports, expert groups and consultations we've already had, we now get the announcement that we will get on with establishing a task force. That can only mean further delay. And I listened with disbelief to the accusation that there had been a lack of clarity on behalf of the UK government when it comes to funding, when the real lack of clarity lies at his door, and when Scotland is getting left behind amongst other nations in the UK when it comes to the future of farming support. But let me be clear. We welcome the progress that has been made with payments this year and the various commitments in relation to mitigating poor weather and pressures on winter forage. We continue to want to play our part in assisting with the creation of a new support system and are more than happy to meet with the Scottish Government. But given the absence of an agriculture bill in this year's programme for government, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, when will we see primary legislation in this Parliament to mirror the UK agriculture bill or will he continue to keep Scotland's farmers and crofters in the dark? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm pleased that Mr Cameron does recognise the progress that's made. I had expected that he might welcome the announcement of around £40 million for the X scheme, which I, I've made today, which I, I know some of his colleagues has, have advocated, uh, quite rightly so. Uh, I mean, I welcome the prospect of working together, as I've already said. I'm afraid I don't accept the premises that underlie the questions, uh, and I particularly don't accept that we haven't set out a plan. We have set out a plan for five years. In fact, this is the most detailed plan in the UK. The documents produced by DEFRA uh, don't say what is going to happen. They say what they're going to stop doing. And interestingly, presiding officer, it was the Scottish farmer of the 22nd of September, whose editorial asks Mr. Gove this question. Does Mr. Gove really think that British farmers, and especially Scottish farmers, can survive without financial assistance for producing food? The UK government is proposing uh, to scrap direct payment, direct support for farmers for food production. I profoundly believe that is wrong. And I very much hope that this parliament will agree with me that such support, as well as support for the environmental role, is absolutely essential uh, for the sustainability of our farming. As the Scottish farmer argue, and they are frankly in a position to argue with some Authority. As to the question about publication of the bill, I attended uh, a further meeting with Mr. Gove and other UK ministers, in fact, two meetings a week ago last Monday with, with uh, my, my colleague, Marie Goujon, uh, and I made the point that the current UK agriculture bill, unfortunately, impinges upon devolved powers in three respects. And I did so despite the fact that we received a copy of the final bill on the eve only of its publication. But notwithstanding that, we have received very strong advice that the UK Agriculture Bill conducts a power grab over significant devolved powers. That's completely unacceptable to us, and we will continue to seek to reason with Mr Gove to amend the bill accordingly. Colin Smith. And thank you to the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of his statement. President Officer, today's statement is telling more for what it doesn't tell us than for what it does tell us was that I welcome any progress in payments, in particular in relation to LFAS. Will the Cabinet Secretary say exactly where the Government are with progress in relation to Pillar 2 payments, given that the most recent update earlier this month showed progress in some schemes as low as 30 per cent, and there will be some scepticism over his claim payments will be delivered by December? The Cabinet Secretary also announced that there will be a further round of the Agro-Environment Climate Scheme, which is, is welcome. But will he tell us when applications will open uh, and whether there will also be a further round of the Food Processing, Marketing and Cooperation Grant? Uh, and finally, the Cabinet Secretary says he now wants a debate on long-term reform. But does he not accept this is a debate that should have happened a long time ago? The clock is ticking towards Brexit and what the sector wants is clear detailed proposals from the government for support for the rural economy and they want that sooner rather than later. 
Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I thank Mr Smith for the answer and to answer his questions directly across Pillar 2 as a whole, we have now paid 81% of claims and 70% of total anticipated value. I, I, I continue to provide REC with uh, details of every single payment, but uh, I'm very pleased that progress has been significantly improved from last year. Uh, secondly, when will AICS be open? It will be open early next year, and I repeat the opportunity that we welcome uh, a submission set for this scheme, which has been undersubscribed in the past. Um, thirdly, the food processing and marketing grants, I, I will revert to Mr. Smith about that. There is still some funding left, and I will check the position, but again, I would urge those who wish to make applications uh, to contact my officials with regard to that. With Granter's final point, I do respectfully disagree, presiding officer. I repeat that our plan uh, set out for the next period of five years, stability and simplicity, uh, is one that has received a broad welcome and in particular the fundamental tenet of the plan is to continue to continue to provide certainty and stability by continuing so far as we can uh, with the current schemes as is and schemes that support farmers in producing high quality beef and lamb things that I thought were self-evidently beyond party politics as an objective in this parliament there are no other plans uh, in the UK. There, there is no plan. Uh, there is health and harmony, which uh, sets out what they will not do, i.e. continue to support farmers with direct payments. But it doesn't say, as indeed the Scottish farmer pointed out, how much funding there will be. Uh, read the Scottish farmer. I mean, there's lots of farmers over there. I suggest I recommend it to, to you guys. And just the last point I'd make, we've set out, presiding officer, a plan for five years. It's difficult to know what the plans of the UK government are for five months or even five days. Thank you. I have 11 members wanting to ask questions. I've got 11 minutes, so I can only get anywhere with these with your assistance, and that's to everyone in the chamber. I call John Finney to be followed by Mike Rumbles. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I uh, obviously welcome the 40 million for the Agri uh, um, Environment Scheme and oppose any power grab. Cabinet Secretary, we welcome your finally committing to the Scottish Parliament and drafting the principles of Scotland's future farm policy. You mentioned in your statement the various bodies that were put in place to look at this, now dating back several years. Was it all within the remits of of these groups to develop sound principles for farm policy and if not what was the purpose of them being constituted in the first place? Cabinet Secretary. Well, well I thank Mr Finney for his support uh, for the AICS announcement which I, I think will make a substantial contribution to carrying out in vital environmental schemes throughout the country as indeed it has uh, and uh, I, I, uh, I'm very pleased that we share common ground on that. So far as his, his comments about um, those who've been uh, appointed to, uh, to guide us and us all in relation to the future of uh, farming policy in Scotland post-Brexit, if Brexit happens, and, and who knows, frankly, about that. But those who have been doing that haven't <coughs> been doing it for several years, uh, uh, with respect, as Mr Finney says. They have been doing it at the express behest of this parliament. It was uh, an motion as amended, I think, by Mr Rumble's amendment that required or called on the Scottish Government to appoint a group of people who would have the remit of considering these matters. That is exactly what we have done. We did exactly what Parliament asked us to do. That report will be published imminently. And I'm extremely grateful because to, the, to all of the members of the National Council of Rural Advisors, the Agricultural Champions, Professor Russell Griggs, and the NCRA uh, comprised people from all walks of life in rural Scotland who have a wealth of knowledge and experience. And I sincerely hope that the recommendations, when they are available, will be taken seriously by all colleagues around the chamber so that we are able to reach uh, some kind of consensus about the best path forward for Scotland's uh, rural policy in future. Mike Rumbles, followed by Maureen Watt. Presiding officer, um, on the 19th of January 2017, it was my amendment calling on the government to provide advice as to the principles and policies for rural support beyond 2020. That was passed unanimously. Even the minister voted for it. The minister, however, in his statement has just said, I, understand, I undertake to bring forward a motion which will allow us to debate the principles that underpin Scotland's future farm policy. Deputy Presiding Officer, just how long is this taking? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, a, well, I, I, first of all, I would commend to Mr. Rumbles 
a good reading of the stability and simplicity document, which sets out a plan for five years, five years about financial future. And speaking to farmers, you know, what they say is that's exactly what they want. They want to know where they stand, not for a period of a few months, which of course they don't know under the shambles or the buruk of Brexit policy in the UK, but for a long sustained period where they can then plan for the future after that. Whilst I will respond formally in due course to the NCRA report uh, uh, and the responses to our, the 100 and over 120 responses to the stability and simplicity document, I can say initially that there has been broad support for the fundamental plank of our document. Uh, now, it was Mr. Rumbles, and I did mention, I gave him credit for the amendment. I mean, sometimes I think Mr. Rumbles doesn't take yes for an answer, which is a bit unfortunate. Uh, but uh, I'm delighted that we did exactly what, uh, what we all voted for in that motion, to convene a group of people to do the work. For goodness sake, let's wait until the reports are published very soon indeed and have the debate after that. Surely that's the sensible approach. Maureen Watt, followed by John Scott. Uh, thank you, Officer. And I apologise to the Chamber for having to leave after my question. Cabinet Secretary, last Wednesday in this Parliament at the Cross-Party Group, on food chaired by John Scott and attended by Peter Chapman and myself. Ian Wright, the chief executive of UK Food and Drink, the UK Food and Drink Federation, painted a very bleak future for Scottish agriculture and for sheep farmers in particular as a result of Brexit. This is compounded, it would appear, no, I'm sorry, from Ms. the Watt. comments of Please Carmen be disciplined Hubbard and ask of Newcastle a question. University and Professor Wallace of the University College of Dublin by the proposals contained oh. in the UK Government's Agriculture Bill. What reassurances of any, any can you, Cabinet Secretary, give sheep farmers in Scotland, particularly those on the hills, who make a vital contribution to food now, production, but also to its landscape? That's less than a minute. Uh, Maybe your question, but I did ask for people to be fair less to each other, so let's just have questions, please, from now on. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think Ms. Watt is right to raise this. It's extremely serious. We are absolutely committed to continuing to provide vital support to our hill farmers in Scotland. The Elfast scheme is that which they currently hold most dear and is most significant. And it's absolutely essential. And indeed, there's a growing volume of evidence uh, referred to that suggests that the impact of Brexit could be so great uh, uh, that it could result in modern day clearances in rural and highland Scotland. It is extremely serious. Report after report, National Audit Office, the Fraser of Allender report, Highlands and Islands Agricultural Support Group, not, none of them are politically affiliated. All of them say the same thing, that the threat to our hill farming community in Scotland is very real indeed. And I do hope that the Scottish Conservatives will decide where they stand uh, on the side of the Scottish hill farmers or on the UK government who plan to withdraw their direct support. John Scott, followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm declaring an interest as a farmer and a food producer. Um, Presiding Officer, farmers and crofters will welcome this update and the further funding of 40 million for the IX scheme, but it does little to help resolve the problems they are facing as they go into this winter with annual feed shortages already looming, overdrafts growing to unsustainable levels, and many upland livestock farmers and crofters actively considering whether they have a future in farming in the face of the constantly reducing profitability of the red meat sector. What immediate and practical financial help, different from years past, can the government give to help this sector before many more farmers leave the industry and Scotland's rural landscapes become still more Cabinet depopulated? Secretary. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think Mr Scott raises a very serious point, and I do agree that the impacts of, of, of weather, both in the first and then the second part of the year, uh, heavy rain and snow and then drought, have been extremely severe. I'm acutely aware of this, as he is, and having attended a great number of agricultural shows in the country, I had a number of lengthy conversations about farmers who were treating this very seriously, so we take this seriously as well. That is why, exactly why, and it was actually after a meeting uh, a group of farmers at the Black Isle show uh, on the, uh, in August, that on the 13th of August, I made the early announcement that we would bring forward to as early a date as possible the payment of the national loan scheme at up to 90%. This is money, of course, that they're due, but getting that money as early as possible, I thought, was the most practical thing, Mr. Scott, that we could conceivably do. 
Uh, had it been possible to bring it earlier forward than the week commencing the 8th of October, we would have done so. The reason we can't do that is simply because the payments cannot be calculated until the euro exchange rate has been calculated based upon a basket of figures in September, ending in 30th September. The, the earliest payment we can make is the 8th of October, uh, and I'm hopeful that payments will start to go out then. Over 14,000 loan offers have been issued. 81% of eligible claimants have had these loan offers. That is the most concrete thing that we can do. We've also had the Agricultural Weather Panel meet regularly. We also, uh, and they have, uh, uh, have provided very useful advice, as have the NFUS in their excellent campaign on these practical matters. There are other specific measures about which I undertake to write to Mr. Scott because I think I'm probably going a bit over my time. But let me say I'm taking this very seriously indeed. I do understand that it's not over yet and indeed more problems might come down the line uh, early next year with animals that uh, are not as well nourished as perhaps they should have been in ordinary circumstances. Stuart Stevenson followed by Claudia Beamish. Uh, I declare I have a small registered agricultural holding. Uh, presiding officer, I sat next to Michael Gove at the Turra show and he promised me uh, that the Scottish Government be consulted on the UK Agriculture Bill and that the convergence It's uh, interesting to hear you sat next to him. I want your question. Can the uh, Cabinet Secretary uh, tell me if he has any information on who in the Conservative Government at the UK is blocking Mr Gove's very honourable promises he made to me and to the rest of us? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm reminded of your comment that... Uh, Sitting side by side doesn't mean that he's on our side. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I can tell you that uh, I have sat opposite Mr. Gove at numerous meetings and called upon him to implement the, the pledge that he himself made and made public and it was welcomed by the Conservatives. Indeed, they claim credit for it. But he hasn't delivered. He hasn't delivered yet. Uh, there is substantial support from stakeholders, including the NFUS, the Tenant Farmers, the Crofters Federation, we're all supportive of the review and I believe continue to support that review. The review must look back at what happened uh, in the past in relation to our claim for £160 million that uh, our farmers and crofters should have received £14,000 per head that they had been denied. And it's essential to allocate in future Scotland's share of funding where Brexit to go ahead. And the last point I make, presiding officer, is that next year, 2019, uh, when you compare the amount paid per hectare to farmers all over the European Union, and we'll include Scotland and the UK in this for the time being, the amount paid to Scottish farmers will be the lowest, the lowest, not just in the UK, but every single one of the 29 countries. So that review is absolutely essential, and it's time that the Tories in London started to implement their promises, not break them. Claudia Beamish. Uh, Sorry, you, followed by Angus MacDonald. will have to be very brief. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. As the Cabinet Secretary knows, agriculture is one of the heaviest greenhouse gas emitters in Scotland. Can he reassure the Chamber today that future plans are going to tackle this issue, which was highlighted this week by the UK Committee on Climate Change, by having a just transition to agroecology with a clear advice and support system for innovation, which must play a big role in sustainable farming futures. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I'm happy to confirm that we will continue uh, to encourage uh, and in some cases require uh, farmers to carry out measures which will contribute to reducing their carbon footprint overall. A great amount of work has been done uh, and I'd like to acknowledge that and sometimes I think perhaps farmers and crofters don't actually get the credit for the things that they do do uh, and in many cases using less fertilizer for example uh, can be good economically as well as for the environment and carbon testing for example is mandatory in the beef efficiency scheme and other areas as I understand it. So the direction of travel is to encourage farmers to do even more uh, and I'm very happy to uh, discuss this matter with Ms Beamish further as I know that she takes a very close interest in it. Angus MacDonald, very briefly. The further round of agri-environment climate change, uh, climate scheme funding is very welcome. Uh, however, these are long-term grants, uh, as are those for tree planting. Can the Cabinet Secretary assure grant applicants uh, about the long-term sustainability of the pro proposals 
uh, and basically put it simply, will they get their grants post-Brexit? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes. And uh, briefly too, please. We would not launch this further round of aches or continue to encourage indeed forestry grant applications if we were not committed to paying people the grants over the long term. I welcome the commitment from the UK government uh, to uh, continue the payments uh, of uh, uh, these Pillar 2 applications uh, for a further year. And after that decision, which was intimated to us only relatively recently, only then was it possible for us to make the announcement that we were therefore, as a result, able to go forward with the AIC scheme. So the answer to Mr. McDonald's question is yes. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry that must conclude questions on that. And I apologise to Peter Chapman, Alistair Allen, Ian Green, John Mason. Um, it's in your hands to some extent and into the front bench if you manage to get through all the questions. I must move on to the next statement and I'm going to go straight on to it so don't waste any more time.